Box Conference, uh, Windows Snyder. She's been here several times. And uh, today, she's going to talk about uh, tools and strategies for securing, a, for securing a large development project. I, I believe she's going to share with us you know, the experiences they have in uh, Mo at the Mo at Mozilla Foundation for, um, for developing you know, large-scale large, large -scale software projects. And uh, maybe just, just a few words of, about, about Ms. Snyder for, for those of you all who may not be familiar with, it, with her. Prior to joining Mozilla, or rather she, she's currently a chief security something or other at Mozilla Corporation. <laughs> okay, uh, but prior to joining Mozilla, she has, uh, you know, she's been working with several high-profile organizations uh, like Microsoft and uh, and and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and also at at, at stake. So, uh, without wasting any more time, uh, let's welcome Ms. Snyder. So I do want to talk to you about uh, what we've been doing over at Mozilla, um, how we are working on securing a tremendous development project, and uh, also you know, give you a chance to follow up from, from last year. Last year, I was here. I'd only been in the job for a few weeks when I, when I came to speak and tell you what we were going to do at Mozilla. So I'd like at this point to uh, have a chance to tell you what we've done and how we're measuring success. So um, for some of you, might not be familiar with Mozilla, so just a little bit of background before we talk about the overall security process that we're now using in place. I think before we talked about what, I, what we were going to implement, and now uh, a little bit about what's currently in place and what we're working on for the future in terms of security process, um, and how you can apply this to your own development environment in order to make your development projects more secure. A little bit on how we measure success and the problem security metrics currently, and uh, then give you a preview for what's coming in Firefox 3 in terms of security features, and then you know, talk about the tools that we released uh, a couple of months ago, and, uh, and how you can also use them in your, your own environment. So there's, I get a lot of uh, questions about, you know, oh, do you work for Firefox? Well, Firefox is a web browser. Mozilla is the project. And it's, um, it's made up of, of a corporation, a foundation, and thousands and thousands of volunteers, people who are you know, just like you and me, who want to create, promote choice and, 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 and uh, openness on the, on the web. Um, and it's, it is the producer of, of the Firefox browser, which more than 100 million people are using today. So th there's about, it's about 20-something percent um, worldwide, about 100 million users, only about 14.3 percent in, in Asia, uh, which we'd like to you know, see come up. So that's one of the reasons I'm out here talking to you guys today. It's, uh, it's got a tre tremendous presence in, in, in Europe. About 28% of, uh, of Europe is running Firefox right now, including Finland, who is a, a, we're actually at about 45%, which I think is tremendous. 45% of Finland runs, runs Firefox. I don't know why they love us, but they do. And also, you can see, occasionally, other people are running Firefox. So I think security, uh, our, our, our open and transparent processes are uh, potentially a, a risk to us. You know exposing all the gory details of what's going on internally is, is, is definitely painful. And there's a, there's a good reason that most corporations don't like to do that. Um, but I also think that it's our, our greatest opportunity for improving security and leveraging all the knowledge from the community, especially you guys, um, to help us make the process more secure. One of the reasons that I think transparency really contributes to a more secure uh, project is that the, the community can engage in, in testing and in, and in source code review. One of the things that's really different about this project is that with the traditional vendor, uh, you guys get to participate after they, they do all their design behind closed doors, they do their implementation behind closed doors, maybe they bring in some contractors or something to work on the project, but the community only really gets involved after they ship the project and then we have a chance to bang on it and if we've identified vulnerabilities, hopefully they report them to the vendor and then hopefully the vendor produces a patch and uh, you know, the cycle continues in that regard. But with Mozilla, because everything is open, you can participate you know, at every stage of the game. Maybe you're not a penetration tester, maybe you're not, um, maybe that's not how you want to spend your time. Maybe you are better at design and security features. Well, you can get involved at, in, in the Mozilla project at any phase of the development process. That means you can participate in design meetings, you can call up, they're, they're posted on the, on the wiki page, you can call up and, and participate. You can, if you have ideas, you can contribute them that way. If you want to uh, you can participate at the implementation level, you can uh, write features. If there's a feature you really want to see, you can write it and advocate for, for getting it into the core browser. You can develop tools that help us with testing. You can develop 
fuzz testers, uh, source code analysis. We have a lot of actual uh, security tool vendors that participate by using the Mozilla source code base to test their own tools. So in that way, they're helping the Mozilla project, but they're also making their own tools better. And then, of course, you can participate in the traditional way once it's shipped, identify vulnerability, report it to us, hopefully, and we'll ship a patch, definitely, and, um, you know, and work, on, work, on a, work with us in the traditional way. But you can also participate um, all along the process, and that leads to a much richer experience. And it's better for, for all of us in that. And there's, a lot of, there's a lot of knowledge out here that we'd like to capture, and not just at the end of the process, you know, working with penetration testers. Additionally, because the, the, the code base is open, you don't have to reverse engineer trying to figure out proprietary file formats or protocols. Everything's available to you, so you can spend your time in analysis and not trying to do reconnaissance to try and figure out how things work. Additionally, when we say something, you don't, I mean, it's, it's great if you believe us, but you don't have to. You don't have to take our word for it. it you, know, you can check our work. The source code is there. We document you know, what we're working on. We're trying to get better at document, documenting things, but you can, you can sit in our meetings and, uh, and, and listen to them. We know that Microsoft is doing this. Uh, we ha and, you know, we're open to it. We're happy about it, actually. We, uh, we found out that they, they had been taking meetings at one of our notes because it came back to us in an email. We're like, oh, that's cool. And we're glad that they're, they're, uh, they're listening. We'd love to hear some feedback, even. Um, Another thing that's different here is that we're trying to do real-time updates on vulnerabilities. When something's announced or someone comes out with a vulnerability, it might be days, weeks, whatever, before you hear a response from the vendor about what, what's, what's really happening here. We try to let you know what we know when we know it so that there's not this guessing going around, that you actually have the real information from the vendor as, as best we know it. And when we make a mistake or we're wrong about something, we say so and you know, correct our information and you know, always give you the most up-to-date information. That's something that's really different. So we have a security group of about 85 people. It's listed at that URL right there. If you want to check and see who has access to all the bugs, all the, all the security bugs, um, you, know, you, can, you can see who are the individuals in the security group. Now this is also unique because we want to make sure that we have an opportunity to um, share security issues with our community, but at the same time we don't want to put the entire code uh, in the entire user base at risk. There's 100 million people out there, so if we give details of a vulnerability before it's patched, we potentially put those users at risk because we could use that information to you know, uh, construct an exploit or something. So we want to make sure that we're doing something that's reasonable for our users. So the compromise we came up with was creating a security group from the community, and that is represented representative of people in the, in the corporation. It's people at different vendors like Red Hat and IBM and um, Sun, there are, there are people representing all these different vendors who get to who, who have a, a stake in, in, in particular security issues, and they all contribute ideas. Um, let us know if they, uh, you know, want to see a different fix. Or contribute to um, the body of knowledge going into making these decisions. So, so that's I think a reasonable compromise between sharing everything with the community and um, and and keeping everything completely quiet. And of course, once once a bug is fixed, we make the details available to everybody, unless it. It, it exposes uh, information about another particular bug. So for example, bugs that are found, let's say, through a fuzzer. If, that, if a set of bugs are fixed that were found by that fuzzer, but other bugs are still there, then you know, those, those bugs, the details of those bugs will have to stay closed, otherwise um, that, that particular fuzzer might be used to identify other bugs. Uh, things that are, 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 are important here are that we consider every feature a security feature. Every feature is a security feature because they all have impact on the overall security architecture of the application. That is, they all, you know, we consider whether or not it introduces new entry points into the system. We consider, uh, you know, is it storing files? Is it, uh, you know, what is it doing that can, and how does that impact the overall security of the application? And of course, we design everything with security in mind. Another thing that's really, really different here is that security testing is continuous throughout the development process. But we release the work that we're doing in our security updates every six to eight weeks. Now, other vendors do security updates on a regular basis, but the work that goes into the security updates are vulnerabilities that are identified from the outside. Um, work that is vulnerabilities that are identified through the development process, QA process, if they engage vendors to come in and find those vulnerabilities, those are packaged up in service packs and major releases. And for those vendors, that makes sense because they have applica application compatibility tests that span hundreds of applications. And you know, all that work needs the benefit of a full test pack. But because we have 20,000 people nightly downloading um, uh, nightly builds, we have the breadth of testing that other development environments couldn't put together with all the resources in the world. Right? We've got 20,000 different users with 20,000 different machines, with 20,000 different sets of applications and 20,000 different drivers and 20,000 different sets of, of add-ons, visiting 20,000 different sets of websites. That, that kind of breadth is something that we could not possibly, uh, you know, with all the resources we had, we couldn't build that in-house no matter what. So we can get 
uh, a tremendous amount of testing done in a very short amount of time, which means that for you, the user or you know, the, the community member here, you don't have to wait a year to get the benefit of the work that we're doing internally. We put that out continuously. Now, one of the things that uh, we'll talk about this in, when we talk about metrics in a little bit is that you see all of the bugs that we're working on. One of the things that we, that we do is make sure that we are threat modeling to make sure we understand where the highest risk components are in the system and help us build test cases for penetration testing and make sure that we've identified all the, the major um, risks to the system and that we have mitigations in place to address all of those. So one of the things that's um, newer for Firefox 3 is, is component security review. That as we are introducing new features into the system, we are going through component security review to make sure that um, any new threats to the system that are introduced are being mitigated, that the mitigations are adequate, and um, that they have test cases to support it. It also helps us understand how features that are not necessarily considered security features actually have security impact. One of the things that we've identified is that um, in Firefox 2, we had this. We had we introduced a feature um, called Session Restore. That if you were browsing along and it came time for uh, Windows to install an update and uh, needed to reboot your machine, you've got you know 15 different pages open because you're researching cars or something, right? All that work um, comes up when your browser restarts. So that's important. We didn't think of it as a security feature, but in fact, it is a security feature because it reduces the barrier to entry when someone says. When, it's time, when Firefox says, oh, we have an update available to you, do you want to install it now? Users are able to say, yeah, go ahead, because they know that their place is going to be saved. So if anything that contributes to users getting patches installed more quickly, we consider a security feature. So there's kind of a roundabout way of identifying through threat modeling how, how session restore is actually a security feature. We didn't think about it that way when we implemented it, but when we think about it now because it's reducing the barriers to users um, installing updates as soon as they come out. One of the things that we are, we're also doing um, consistently, and everybody should be, is code review. We're making sure that when you're looking at a million, you know, millions and millions of lines of source code, how do you identify how to go about source code review when you've got such a massive project? Well, we began with threat modeling to identify which components were at highest risk. And we do code review on those particular components and make sure that we're addressing things as, they, as, we, as we know about them. So if we know about particular code constructs, and we're looking for that set of code constructs as we you know, go through the highest risk components, but also as we write new code. So during peer review for check-ins, we're identifying whether or not any of, those, any of that new code contains any of the set of code constructs that we've previously identified as potentially being security, uh, leading to security issues. So this is a, an example of the sorts of things that we're looking for, improper string handling, arithmetic, arithmetic errors, and so on. But um, the bottom line is that if you, if you start with a, um, if, you, if you can't address everything because you've got millions and millions of lines of code and you've got a new code construct now you're, that you're looking for because you're, you realize, oh, wow, I hadn't thought of this before, but this particular con code construct can lead to security issues. How do you go about you know, going through millions of lines of code by hand, potentially, and, and, and identifying that? Well, that's difficult. So what you start with is uh, the high risk areas and then you maintain it as you add new code. And over time, the, the, code, uh, the code base is replaced, and the areas that you're most concerned with are, are, are addressed. So one of the things we do is before you can check in, it has to be peer reviewed, and they go through this code review process, and you can develop confidence at least for the new code. And the old code um, you know, is potentially mitigated by, maybe mitigated by other mechanisms, like um, additional uh, input validation. And uh, over time, the legacy code uh, gets replaced with new code. Or, or potentially gets re, uh, eliminated as part of a, an attack, attack surface reduction um, plan. So one of the things I also think is incredibly important is getting fresh blood into the environment. Most people don't uh, think that they're themselves implementing security issues, but um, we're, none of us are perfect. And additionally, a new set of eyes can really tell you things that you, know, you, you might not expect. Security consultants go around to other environments and they get to see what everyone else is doing. So in your own environment, you might be heads down um, and doing what you think is great work. And it probably is great work, but these other people have had a chance to look at all these different environments. And so they can tell you, you know, they've seen this before and this is how it was solved or um, you know, uh, uh, this has caused problems in the past and you know, uh, maybe it's not an issue for you right now, but it might be in the future. So you wanna, might want to put a mitigation in place for that. So it's a different perspective. They're not personally invested in, in, in the way things have been implemented or architected, so there's no 